Hello, it's Stephen here, and we're going to bring you an individual object every couple of weeks that you might want to look at in the night sky. For the first video in this mini-series, we're going to look at the Hercules Globular Cluster, and I'm joined by my good friend and the astronomer at Glasgow Science Centre, Steve Owens. Hi, Steve. Hey, Stephen. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Yeah, so we're looking at M13, Messier 13, the globular cluster in the Hercules constellation probably the best globular cluster and visible from Scotland. Yeah, definitely really bright. And one of my followers pointed this uh, cluster out to me or reminded me that it was in a favorable position at the moment. And currently it's uh, gaining altitude in the east. So this view um, is about 11 p.m. And the two stars um, that I think help identify this cluster, because it's not the most obvious thing to find, would be Vega and Arcturus. Um, and Hercules itself, quite faint, I always think. Yeah, it's a tricky constellation to find. You're right, those two stars really help you uh, zero in on it. But it's not an object. The constellation itself and the globular cluster within it are not things that stand out. You've got to use signposts of other constellations to help you find them. So Vega is one of the brightest stars in the sky. Uh, Arcturus on the other side, not quite as bright, but almost. And both of those um, if you draw a line in between, the object we're looking for is about slightly less than halfway from Vega to Arcturus. Yeah, and if you kind of zoom in, you get to see then the stars of the Keystone and Hercules. But again, I, I struggle a wee bit to see these sometimes, especially if there's sky glow. It's definitely not a very bright constellation, so p potentially you want to move in with some binoculars at that point. Yes, and you'll be able to see the globular cluster with the naked eye if you've got good eyesight and good seeing conditions with your dark sky without any clouds in it. Um, but it is faint and it won't look like anything other than uh, a really faint smudge, smudgy star uh, to the naked eye. But not because it's help a little, they won't magnify it enough for you to see any detail within the cluster. But you'll certainly be able to see that it isn't a pinpoint sharp star like the others around. It is a, a fuzzy thing. And in general, the fuzzy things are the interesting ones. Yeah, exactly. And I'm now mo moving in uh, for a closer view. Um, so yeah, I agree. Um, binoculars, I can see it as a kind of diffuse, slightly defocused star. Um, but perhaps this might be the view you might see through maybe an 8-inch telescope under favourable conditions. Yeah, I've um, seen it through, through smaller telescopes than that, but it's, you've got to have good conditions. And with something maybe like a a four or a six inch telescope, you might start to be able to make out individual stars around the central blob. But the bigger the telescope, the more light you're gathering and the, the easier it will be to, to um, draw those out, separate those from the cluster. So we should maybe talk about what we're looking at here, Steve. Um, I, I think that the description globular cluster is fairly apt. I mean, we're talking about a sphere of stars, right? Very densely um, populated. That's right, yeah. So this is a, a, a large cluster of stars, much larger than other clusters you might be able to see, like the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. Those little clusters are clusters of a few thousand stars inside our galaxy. But in this globular cluster, we're talking about 100,000 stars, maybe more, and beyond the disk of our galaxy. Yeah, and um, I was looking uh, recently at the density within these clusters, and they're about 100 times more dense than our local neighbourhood of our galaxy. So if we think about the distribution of stars, or stars close to us, we're talking about 100 times greater. And the, the night sky on a planet round one of those stars would look incredible. So you can imagine when you look up at night from, from the planet Earth, there's stars up there, but they are faint and there aren't you know, a few thousand of them with the naked eye, but they don't fill the sky. Inside a globular cluster, the sky would be bright with stars. There would, you know, it would be perhaps not bright as daytime, but maybe twilight levels of brightness coming from all the starlight. Yeah, that's one thing that really um, intrigues me when I look at these objects, is to try to sort of imagine yourself projected into them. But yeah, what would the night sky be like? Dozens and dozens or hundreds and hundreds of very bright stars. And can we get a handle on how many? So I was thinking earlier, Alpha Centauri is about four and a half light years away. 
Um, right. And if we think about that, then that's the closest star to our sun. So what would that say about uh, the number of stars that we might see then that were very bright? Yeah, so if, it's unlikely um, any listeners have seen Alpha Centauri unless they've been lucky enough to go to the southern hemisphere. It's not visible from Scotland. Sirius is a bright star visible in our winter sky. Um, that's about nine light years away. So those two are the two brightest stars visible at night anywhere on Earth. And imagine within the sphere that contains those two stars, there was perhaps 200 stars that were even brighter than those, some of them substantially closer to us. Um, if, if it's 100 times denser, you'll have 100 times as many Alpha Centauri's within this, this sphere of space around the sun that, that reaches out as far as Alpha Centauri. So yeah, it's a it's, it's hard to comprehend. And of course, within such a dense cluster, many of those stars will be much, much closer to any planets there. And they might not even look like stars. They might look like distant, faint suns lighting up those alien planets. Yeah, and what does that say about the potential for the evolution of life? I mean, uh, these clusters are incredibly old, so I believe the Hercules has been dated to potentially 10 billion years old, which is going back uh, to... Um, very early times in terms of the age of the universe. Um, now you might think then that that's a long time for potentially civilizations to evolve, but would these environments be favorable for life to um, propagate and survive over long periods? It's exciting to think about. Certainly there's been enough time there for life to evolve and if you're a, a, a materialist, a rationalist materialist like I am, all you need for life are the right building blocks and enough time for those building blocks to come together. And our planet Earth's been around for four and a half billion years. The stars in M13 are over twice that age, so plenty of time for life to have happened. I think, though, that our um, our suspicion is that life is not very likely on these uh, on planets around these stars, not least of which because the stars are so densely packed that stable planetary orbits might be quite challenging. Mm. If you've got stars right in your doorstep that are moving around and swirling within a cluster, you can imagine those stars stripping planets away from other stars. Uh, and perhaps it's the relative lack of density in our part of the galaxy that allows stable planetary orbits like ours to persist for, for billions of years. Yeah, that's a very good point. And if you've done any work in sort of gravitational dynamics, I've had uh, play around with uh, simulating some of this stuff. Uh, and we know about the classic three body problem. Once you get just a handful of uh, stars that are large and in a close, in close vicinity, then you basically get chaotic behavior. So it would be very difficult, uh, I guess, to, to make long term predictions or to have any sort of stability within these clusters. Yeah, that's right. And as if that wasn't bad enough, the, one of the things we know about stars within globular clusters is that they contain very few metals. And metals is a very broad term that astronomers use to annoy chemists. What astronomers mean by metals is anything heavier than hydrogen. Um, so things we don't think of as metals normally, like oxygen, would, would classify. And those are the things you need to make planets and aliens out of. And there seems to be relatively little stuff in the globular clusters. Plenty of stuff to make stars out of, plenty of hydrogen and helium, but very little of anything else to make planets out of. Yeah, and um, we're looking at a few images um, at the moment as we talk. And I guess it's worth pointing out as well that these stars are not particularly large. Most of the stars in globulars are actually um, have less mass than our sun. Certainly it's uncommon to find stars that are greater than about 80% of the mass of our sun. Yeah, and that makes sense when you think about it because the smaller a star is, the less energetically it burns its fuel and the longer it can survive. So stars like our sun might live 10 billion years, but f smaller, fainter, feebler stars will eke out their fuel much more efficiently and can last significantly longer. So it's not unexpected to find small stars in ancient populations of clusters. And just talking generally about um, globulars in our Milky Way, Steve, um, I believe there's about 150 thereabout of these uh, large globular clusters orbiting um, our Milky Way galaxy. And uh, they tell us something or have told us something about our position within the Milky Way. So I believe by measuring um, the distances to these globulars, we've actually um, determined our position within our own galaxy. Yeah, and one of the things you need to do in astronomy to work out 
how big things are to work out how far away stars are and to get a sense of cosmic distance and scale is to use something called a cosmic distance ladder. So you work out using physics and maths how far away a local star is and then you look at a star that's got an identical signature to that one but is further away and therefore fainter and depending on how much fainter it is you can work out how much further away it is. Now you can do that locally within the Milky Way, the stars around us we can see with just the naked eye out to about 2,000 light years but this population of globular clusters around the Milky Way these are much further away than that so the M13 cluster the one we're talking about just now is something like 22,000 light years away so these are much more distant objects so they allow us to apply the processes the techniques we've used in our cosmic distance ladder and take the next step up that ladder to work out whether these uh, these techniques work yeah and talking about that distance you were um, mentioning there uh, staggering distance away sort of you know 20 to 20 5,000 light years away. But what's quite interesting is in the 1970s, we sent a message uh, towards this globular cluster. We did, yeah, perhaps optimistically, given what we just said about the chances of life being there. Um, but it was one of the exercises carried out by the SETI program that searched for extraterrestrial intelligence. And in fact, rather than searching, just passively looking for extraterrestrials, it was decided that we would beam a message from humankind out into the cosmos and it was decided that the M13 cluster would be a good target for that given how densely packed it was with stars. Yeah, I'm not sure it's going to actually reach the, the cluster. The, the cluster's moving locally, so I, I, it could actually fly by and miss um, the cluster, I believe. Yeah, there have been some sad calculations done about the, the cone of this transmission we sent and how wide it might be when it gets out to that distance. And yeah, there's a there's a chance that we'll miss, miss the globular cluster altogether, even if we did hit, and even if there are intelligent aliens there at just the right time of their evolution to detect our signal and talk to us. It'll still take 45,000 years to get a reply. So it's a, a long-term aspiration in science. Yes. It's not to... Yeah. If you're a pessimist and a, a fan of War of the Worlds as well, some people might argue that sending a message that you know beams our, our location in the <laughs> local uh, galaxy might be a bad idea. I believe the Arecibo message actually tries to convey our location. I think it does, um, yeah, which, as you say, might be a, a bad move of any any Klingons out there. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, excellent. Well, thanks for uh, that chat about the M13 uh, cluster. And uh, I hope um, anyone listening to this gets some clear skies. Uh, do go out and have a look at it. Remember, this is mainly a telescope object. You can see it in binoculars, but you're going to get the best views through a telescope. And thank you very much for joining me, Steve. Thanks, Stephen. And thank you very much for watching and listening.